I'm Mike. Wait a minute. <laughs> Brills. I thought I was Mike. Not but today. I'm Mike. You're, you're my idol. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am Lance. And I'm Mike. And we are just these guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Mike, we... At it again. At it again. We did uh, the introduction chapter of the book last week. Right. We had talked this morning, and you said you had summarized something into yeah. kind of a short sentence. Well, after checking out a, a video that I was watching, uh, thinking about you know, the the twelve two book and what we were going to be doing here. This whole yeah, exercise, this whole uh, opportunity that we have is one that is, if I were going to try to break this whole thing down into one very succinct and applicable sentence. That's a big word there. Mm-hmm. Notice how I couldn't even say it at a normal, <laughs> normal pace. Uh, just a regular guy can't. That's right. This book will, just like the big book, just like, no, I'm not talking about the AA book, but I'm talking <laughs> about the Bible. Yeah. This book will help us to mature. This book, help, and so if you have no interest in maturing, you probably just want to go ahead and not waste your time. <laughs> yeah. But if you have interest in maturing, if you have interest in your uh, relationships getting better, because if I was to put it into one sentence, it would be this. This book will help you learn how to forgive. Excellent. This book will help you learn how to put others first. So yes. do put whatever mature thing it is in there. This book will help you. It's what the Bible does. It's what this does, because this is basically inspired by the Bible. Yes. And so that's the value of this. That's why I'm so excited about walking through on the podcast, the chapters in the book, because it's going to become a resource for so many people Oh yeah. to be able to not just sit down and read it on your own and feel like you're on your own, but you can go right along with this. So I'm excited to see how this works out. And uh, Well, you said, you know, if you don't want to change, if you don't want to, yeah. you know, then, then this book's not for you. Right. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> uh, one. Right. But the light bulb must want to change. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, yep. Well, and that's it's funny you said that this morning because uh, I, I'd spoken with a gentleman who, you know, after he told me what I'm about to reveal, uh, I, I asked him for consent to share this story. Mm. And he was you know, wildly happy to do it. So I'm, yeah. I will not Good. identify him, but sure. his story is is everybody's story that I've ever worked with yeah. using these skills and there's a twist at the end. Gotcha. So has to do with uh, literally changing how you think. Yep. Um, I was trying to think of a cool analogy last night and I couldn't do it. But if you can just focus on the word restructure. Okay. And so think of the things we might restructure. You know, we, we, we restructure our 401k to maximize the amount of, you know, earnings it's going to have. We may restructure our company so as to make it leaner, meaner, and more productive. Sure. Uh, so restructuring implies there is a structure in place. Sure. And if we're going to restructure it, we're, we're changing the structure that's in place into a completely different design. Yeah. And that's what cognitive restructuring is about. So the restructuring is, uh, first you have to realize that there needs something restructured. <laughs> Admit that there is something that needs to be restructured. And no. so it's realizing no. you want... You want no. So help me. Well, and the reason why I say no is is because I I feel most pastors and, and to some degree most psychologists to a large degree mm -hmm. are sitting back waiting for the client to realize okay. there needs to be a change. And I, I I don't see what's wrong with telling them. Sure. Okay. You know, you're going to hell. <laughs> You know, the, the reason your life is miserable is because you ain't got Jesus. 
Sure. Um, you're crazy. The way you're thinking is making your life miserable. They may not know. And so I see it as unethical for me to sit back and wait for them to come to realize that maybe the way they're thinking is causing some of their stress. That's If I go get a surgery, I want the surgeon to come out and say, all right, here's what's wrong with you. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what you will need to do after we're done. Why would I be any different as a psychologist? Yeah. I listen to you, talk to you, and say, all right, here's what you're doing that's wrong. So, you you know, they need to understand, but we can give that to them as well. You bet. Yeah. So if, if we are tender in our feelers, this might be challenging. No, I've, uh, yeah, I've never been tender. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that about you. <laughs> I've heard you're a bit of a straight shooter. Yeah. Almost. Well, I won't go Almost too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I push that line. Yeah. No, it's. But I, I also it's understandable. I understand it's, that. It's best to know, you know, where. And there have been people that I've, I've spoken straight to simply coming from this place of, of I have information and knowledge that if, if you don't understand this, you will continue to be miserable. Sure. So I give you the truth yeah. in as loving a fashion, and, but as straight as a fashion as I can. And some people aren't ready to be spoken to like that. They, they would rather continue to live in that cocoon of, of safety. Oh, yeah. That it's, it's everybody else's fault. Uh, I'm just put upon, and, and that's safe to, to yeah. think I'm not in control. Well, it's like picturing a uh, parachute that is still in, you know, the package on your back, a cocoon of safety, but you're falling. Right. And unless you realize it's time to open that sucker up, things are not going to end well. And the reason why um, I wrote the book, the reason why I, I give the lectures that I do, I'm doing a uh, a seminar for a state conference next week. Mm -hmm. And and this is going to be smack dab in the middle of it. Like blah, 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 you know that blah, 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 you know that, but here's what you don't know. Sure. And what a lot of people don't realize is we can change how we think. Mm -hmm. Example, not the best of examples because this cup is, is not <laughs> <it's> opaque, <laughs> but I can change what I think about. Do I want to think about the cup or do I want to think about the Kansas City Chiefs cup? Do I want to think about the white cup? Do I want to think about the Chiefs cup? That's the what. And that's where most people live their life is choosing what to think about. And the reality is most people choose what they don't want to think about. Mm. Most people don't even realize they can control what they think about. So why? Why do we choose what we don't want to think about? Because we're fraidy cats. Is that just these guys' language enough? Sure. And this is, you you know, they will be thinking about something that worries them or something that upsets them. And as they're experiencing that negative emotion, they will say, I don't want to think about that anymore. Hmm. So they're, they're in fear, they're in pain. And so they're pushing away a thought that is causing that fear and pain. So... Most people, that is how they think. Joyce Meyer blew my mind because she's, she's older. And she said in a seminar in her older years, just Joyce Meyer is just a guy. Mm. Have you ever heard her speak? She's just yeah, a guy. Yeah, I really like her. And she said, you know, I used to think you had to think about every thought that fell into your head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she said for, forever, for many years, I thought if I had a thought, I had to think about it. Yeah. She said, I didn't realize I could choose what I was going to think about. Hmm. And I like, fell out, you know, the weights fell on my chest when she said that because I, I, you know, it was wonderful of her to admit that because that's most everybody. Sure. If I you know, t tell you something, you're going to think about it as you leave. And at some point you may go, you know, I got to stop worrying about that. I got to, I got to get to work. Yeah. So that's where most of us live. And, but we're, what we're doing is we're shifting we're changing the channels on the TV. You know, what 
I'm looking at, what I'm thinking about, and, and usually it's based on what I don't want to be thinking about. So we're really, we feel we're in control, but then we also don't feel in control. And, and it, So if you choose to think about this red cup, yep. that's the what. Now, is the cup half empty or half full? Sure. That's the how. Yeah. And, mm. and so people will say, you know, well, it's half empty. And they're implying that they're a negative thinker. Oh, the cup's half empty. And you know what? I'm just a half empty kind of guy. That's the way I am. I've always been that way. So right. Right. they accept this about themselves partly because they have no idea that it can be changed. Mm. And that's, you know, the dirty little secret that I try to reveal in the four fundamentals with, in the book 12 too, is that we can change not just what we think about, but how we think about it. You bet. And so if I'm a half full kind of guy and you're a half empty kind of guy, we're not imprisoned in that forever. Sure. You can come to be a half full kind of guy and I can start to see things from a half empty perspective. If it suits my purpose, if it helps in that moment, I can shift. Did you hear the word I used? I can shift perspectives, mm. which is the next chapter. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the idea of, of changing how we think, cognitive restructuring, there are uh, literally systems, there are computer programs essentially running in our mind that we sit back and, and just let them run like we have no control over it. And, and so cognitive restructuring... It was developed in the 50s. I think Albert Ellis kicked it off. And in the 60s, it was refined through another, other great uh, smart people that I can't remember their name. Mm -hmm. But they uh, kind of they emphasized these, these skill techniques, you know, some introspection, thinking about what I think about, yeah, pulling those things out. Okay, so I'm sitting here and I am... Definitely the student, definitely the one who is trying to absorb all this, grasp all this, um, you know, with everybody else. And I'm sitting here going, but why do I, do I really, like, do I really need this? Am I, am I thinking that wrong about, is my perspective of life really that wrong? Like, what are some examples that come flying out? that would say absolutely and that this pretty much includes 99% of us your experiences in life mm -hmm. how how you feel um, whether events are positive or negative or neutral okay those experiences that, that's the governing um, motivator of our life our experience how we feel okay so if you can honestly say that these two things, I am happy with every single experience I have all day, every day, all week. <laughs> and if you can honestly say, I choose every single experience I have all day, every day, all week, then you don't need the book. And you're saying that that's achievable. Yes. Okay. And well, then I'm excited. It's not me. It's, it's not. I'm not saying it. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm. I'm bringing. This has been said a million times over and over again. And in, in the field of psychology, that's what cognitive restructuring is about. Because how I think leads to what I feel. Sure. So if I don't like how I'm feeling. I don't tell you to shut up and get out of my house. <laughs> I don't control you, so why would I try to control you? Sure. If I don't like my experience, I change how I think about the situation to bring the experience that I want. Mm -hmm. Now, that does not mean that I can make every single moment happy, happy, joy, joy. That's not life. Right. But if I'm in a situation where I'm miserable... 
I guarantee you it is because of how I am thinking. But I can change how I think to make the situation tolerable. You bet. I, I can change the situation to make it worthwhile. Yeah. Because we're consumed, right, with all of the negativity that everything, I can just say everything that we experience becomes a distraction to be able to stay focused on what we ultimately want if we want it. And that is to have a clarity and a peace to be able to relate with God's will. It becomes a, a negative feedback loop. Okay. If I think negatively, I will feel negative. If I, if I think negative, I feel negative, and I'm going to do negative. And then the fact that I'm doing negative is going to feed back into my thinking. So if I think I can't do something, I will feel like a failure before I even try. And thus, when I go out and do the thing, I will do it in such a way guaranteed that I fail and then that locks in the original thought that I can't do it. Mm. And, and if you've ever had kids, <laughs> sure, I can't do it. Yes, you can. No, I can't. No, try. <laughs> yeah, see, I told you I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Now, we laugh at a kid doing that. We do it all day long every day. Yeah, I was just getting ready to say, are you sure you're talking about a kid? <laughs> yeah. And so, I do that. Right. Yeah, we all do. So, so how we're thinking leads to our experience how we think leads to our experience leads to what we do what we do leads to what we feel i mean they all work together yeah so how you're thinking if if your experiences are not what you want them to be no nope. and so if i think i don't understand the bible if i think uh, thoughts like why would he do this to me there, there's an implied he shouldn't have done it to me so how I'm thinking is now generating that experience. And, and these thought processes are what drive us away from the church, what drive us away from the Bible, what, what drives us away from having that deeper relationship with Jesus. Well, and even our relationships with each other. With each other. Yeah. We, a, you know, a wedge starts to develop because of how we're perceiving the other person treats us, what, you know, we attribute motives to them that may not be true. Well, they only said that because they don't like me. Right. I, I hear it with employment all the time is, you know, I got fired and like, they don't care about me. I give them everything I ever had. I mean, it's a job. It's not a wife. <laughs> I want, at some point I want to name that voice. <laughs> that, that that voice has a name because <laughs> that's a character. <laughs> we have to put a name to it. I'm re I'm hearing it <laughs> oh, no. repeated as that person. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm gonna come up with it this week. <laughs> we'll start and I'll having, be able to say, "Hey, there's so and so." We'll have, we'll have characters and put on different hats. Yeah. Right. But yeah, changing how you think changes your experience. So honestly. That this is, again, it's the dirty little secret. Now, I said this isn't, don't believe me, this isn't me. Right. This is, Paul said. Yep. Paul said. Yep. Finally, my brethren, whatever is lovely. Sure. Whatever is noble, whatever is worthy, whatever is excellent. Think on these things. Yep. So, so if you haven't made the connection... That's the 12 to connection. That's Romans 12 to. That's why you can trust that this isn't anything brand new. This goes all the way back to Paul being inspired to write that changing your mind is the key, changing the way you think. And that's ultimately. Well, and, and that, that, that quote comes from the end of, uh, of Romans. I think it was Romans. He, if you listen to what he is saying, and again, you have to study word by word. Mm -hmm. Finally, my brethren, whatever. And so the implication when I say whatever is there's a bunch of stuff here. And now you're going to choose something from that bunch of stuff. So when I say whatever yep. is lovely, the implication is there's stuff they're not lovely. Sure. So whatever is noble. 
Yep. Then that implies there's stuff here that's not noble. Whatever is worthy, that implies there's stuff here that's not worthy. So essentially he is saying in all situations, finally, my brethren, in all situations, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, in every single situation you encounter in your life, whether it's sitting on the toilet in the morning or going grocery shopping at Aldi's, in every single situation, there are positives and there are negatives. Yeah, he could have said whatever isn't lovely, whatever isn't noble, and he would have been focused on the negative, right? Right. Yeah, and so that's... So he's, he's showing us that in a situation, there's negative stuff and there's positive stuff. His encouragement is you choose to focus on, mm-hmm. and he gives you options. Not every situation is fun. Right. But it may be noble. Sure. I, I don't find it fun going up and, you know, uh, I haven't done this yet, but <laughs> but going up to the church on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. and mowing the lawn and weed, you know, pulling weeds. That's you know, not fun. The grass is getting pretty tall, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what are you waiting for? I'll call your dad. <laughs> I'll call what's yeah, his name. He, right. No, but that's not a fun morning. Mm. But it's noble. Yeah. And yeah. so rather than focusing on the hard work and how much this sucks and nobody cares, I do all this work for everybody and what do they say? They just say thanks. Sure. You know, it's noble. Yeah. This is this is what I can give. I can't give a lot of money, but I can come up and give up my time. Yeah. A so, shift, a change in how we think. Yeah. So a shift for me very recently uh, was that this is just one example. And it's one very good example, by the way, of an opportunity to grow. An opportunity to break away from some of the things that are keeping us stuck in a immaturity that we don't want to admit is there, but if we will just simply admit that it's there, that we can grow in our uh, ability to think in a healthier way, then this is, it's just all there for us. It's there for us to experience and it's all there for us to grow and, and have a, have a higher quality of life, which by the way, is not just for us, it's for everybody around us. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, I get amped up. I get very excited about this. And that, that I, yeah, the, the extension and, and where this book can take somebody. And, and with a lot of things that I do, I'm like, I'm a broken record. But somebody will come in, um, you know, with a relationship problem. Right. We're going to start with these four things. Yeah. But th- th- You know, the Bible says that a man without self-control is like a city whose walls, a city has been broken into and walls have been laid bare. Right. The heck does that mean? A city back in the day built walls around it to protect itself from outside attack. Yep. And so if the walls are down, Jericho, the city is vulnerable to being attacked by outside forces. Yep. So if you want to be safe, you want your walls up. And so the the comparison here, the logical shift in thinking is if you feel unsafe in your environment, that means you don't have Mm self-control. If you want to feel safe in any environment, first step, develop self-control. You bet. I watched... uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, Sherlock Holmes from 2009 mm-hmm. the other night. And as, as I'm watching it, uh, he's running through this, this maze or the castle or something. And he turns the corner and unexpectedly there's a, a henchman. And instead of panicking and freaking out and running out, he steps back and he thinks through a plan. Mm. He is focusing on controlling himself. Sure. Okay, here's a challenge. Hmm, how am I going to face this challenge? Let me come up with a plan. Yeah. And then he turns the corner, executes his plan and keeps going. Yeah. So he is safe, not because he's a badass fighter. He is safe because he is focusing on controlling himself. You bet. Deciding how to approach the situation and then executing that plan. Yep. 
So I'll take that analogy one step further because in my mind, this is pretty brilliant. That's to be concluded when it comes out of my mouth because you know how the, there's a proverb that says about the fool who keeps his mouth shut and just keeps everybody from understanding how foolish he is. <laughs> uh, if, you're, if your walls are fortified, there's another layer of protection that you can put in place, and that would be a pack of dogs inside the house. Which, by the way, uh, <laughs> if you know this lady named Tish, she loves to rescue dogs. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so, uh, but there is a, another proverb that says, as a dog returns to its vomit, <laughs> so a fool. Now, this one has always hit me right between the eyes. Talk about sucker punch. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And when we just simply refuse almost to change the way we think, it's like a fool who thinks he's wise, but he keeps returning to his folly, keeps returning to the crazy. You were talking about crazy, talking about the crazy cycle. It's like crazy train. When you don't have to ride the crazy train, you can get on the gravy train <laughs> of a life that is controlled by you, controlling what you can control, not controlling what you don't, not even trying. So, boom. Yeah. Boom. Hua boom. I. I think that's a good place to wrap this up. Okay. Just leave them with that. Can't wait till next week. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am Lance. And I am Mike. And we are just these guys. You know? Have an awesome week. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>